Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kellen and Todd again from Start Your Systems, where today we're going to be playing the 2022 Daytona or Daytona Detroit Supercross uh, in Monster Energy Supercross 3, the official video game, as we ride as James Stewart. I'm going to be playing first. Uh, Todd will be jumping on the controls here in a little bit. We're going to talk about a couple of things, talk about this track build and a whole lot of other things. Um, but yeah, so this is the Detroit Supercross. We're going to see raced IRL this weekend. Uh, built it in Monster Energy Supercross 3. Try to re replicate it the best that I can. And um, very, you know, kind of basic track, I'd say. Maybe a little cookie cutter, but got a couple unique sections. What do, you, what do you think of this layout so far, Todd? I mean, yeah, I think it's cookie cutter to a certain extent, but there's also chances for some big lines to be had, too. So it's like... I think there's a, a little bit of, of a risk reward, at least in the game so far, it's what it feels like, you know, in real life, obviously things can change, but it feels like there's some big lines to be had if people really want to try and send it. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, you and I, we've been playing around with this track for like the last 20 minutes or so, and mm -hmm. there's definitely a couple pretty big sends if people are really keen to try it, maybe like a triple, triple quad in this coming rhythm or a triple quad triple. Uh, I'll try to get one of them. And then you were working on a while there that uh, triple quad onto the yeah. uh, tabletop in the last rhythm section which is also pretty burly I, I mean it what depends is you know how they build those transitions in real life like if they're good transitions these guys definitely will have a chance yeah i agree like you might see a guy like and I, I don't know maybe sexton will try and do something crazy you know the quad or maybe yeah he's Anderson. the new quad god huh? <laughs> i mean yeah i mean once you go through i guess bubba's camp you kind of learn a little bit you know to just you, you just have to hang it out sometimes yeah so once you go stew, you never go back kind of thing. Or is that, is that the Basically. <laughs> but I mean, he's been working with Chad Reed too. So that's kind of unique, like two different, um, you know, legends of the sport in their own aspect. Yeah, two and, totally different ways of approaching it exactly. too. Like it's, it's gotta be weird going from a guy who is like known for just like hanging it out like mm -hmm. all the time. And obviously Reed had his moments of that. But it was a little more reserved. And right. Was, yeah, and it was always in check, but he would release it when he needed to. Like, when they race each other, Chad and James, like, there was very much the kind of stigma, I guess, that Reed was, was going to consistent his way to the title where yep. James was going to win his way to the title, right? Yep. So, it, like you're saying, it, it's two very different approaches to the races back then. And, um, yeah, maybe Chase will find the perfect middle ground one day, right? Yeah. That, that would, <laughs> and not I'm, find the ground anymore. <laughs> true yeah that would be nice to see especially me as being a honda guy like i yeah it would be, i would love to see that kid you know like we all know he has it in him yep um just got to stay consistent stay off the ground and it'll be good well talking about this track uh detroit tends to have dirt that kind of breaks down a little bit not too much like it, it's in a dome obviously mm -hmm. so it'll end up staying pretty good throughout the day um, but we usually do end up seeing some ruts uh, occasionally we'll see the whoops break down to have kind of the v in them like we saw yep. at minneapolis and it's a long set of whoops this week so um you know kind of thinking about the typical detroit dirt, dirt that we see do you foresee this track turning into a pretty good raceable track or is it is it going to be a little bit tough and one-lined I don't know. I, I, it's gonna, like I said, I think it's gonna come down to how the rhythms play out. Yeah. Um, obviously, if if the whoops break down and into that V shape, and you kind of get like the hop through instead of the skim over, you know, kind of riding style on them, then yeah, I feel like it can get one lined. Um, but honestly, like if it doesn't get too ruddy in the rhythms, that's gonna be like where people are gonna make up their time. I feel like right, then, right. That's where you can uncork like the bigger, the bigger sections. Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Definitely going to be an interesting race weekend to watch. Another thing to watch this weekend, though, Ken Roxon will not be at Detroit this weekend. Just announced earlier today as we were about to record this, actually, that Roxon will be uh, sitting on the sidelines mm -hmm. for at least a little while of the 2022 Monster Energy Supercross season as he deals with some health issues, as he uh, basically said in the press release. Um, you know, he's, he had Epstein-Barr in 2017 and 2018. He dealt with a bit of an illness at the end of 2021. If you go watch an old uh, Instagram of his, he posted how he sounded at the end of 2021. He said it wasn't COVID, but then he did actually deal with a little spout of COVID earlier this year as well. So uh, he's kind of been through the ringer with his health and it's been kind of painfully obvious that he's not been 100% for a while, it seems like in this season. Uh, so he's going to be on the sidelines for a while. And what do you think, Todd? Is this is this kind of a good reset for him, or is it really getting to the point now where we got to talk about Roxon either moving on from Honda or moving on altogether? I think he needs. Yeah, I, I think taking the time off is the right thing to do. I'm gonna be honest. Like, I, I even if it's not a sickness thing and it's him just a confidence thing or him just not gelling with the bike, like has what been rumored, like what's been rumored, like 
it's not helping him in any way to show up and get outside the top 10. Yeah. Outside the, I mean, he should be a top five guy, a top three guy consistently. Right. And the fact that he's outside the top 10 now at, at points, it's like it doesn't help coming into every race. And you're kind of just diminishing whatever uh, confidence that you've had. It just like it has to just keep going down and down after every weekend. Like, so I think hitting the reset button a little bit and just waiting for outdoors might just be the play. Like, yeah, definitely. I could agree with that. I, I think that, you know, for him, it's odd that he's had bike problems this year as well. Like he's talked about struggling in the whoops and just not mm-hmm. really feeling comfortable or feeling the flow. And then, you know, on top of that with the health issues, it just doesn't seem like anything's going right. So even health issues aside, yep. like it almost seems like benching him is the right move just so he can kind of like fix his mindset a little bit, you know, like reset and not be demoralized by where he's been finishing or where he's been riding. Cause he's like you said, he's a, he's a rider caliber of much better than what he's shown. Right. So to just sit it out a little bit and, and kind of regroup. And like you said, coming out swinging, I, I just think it's the right move kind of all around. Yep. I agree. Like it, it's, it's, it's man, it's, it's tough to watch him do it. Like to like, it's kind of like AC in a way, you know what I mean? Like, it's different circumstances, but like AC at the beginning of the year, it was like, man, like I wish he would just stop. And like, I wish he would just get healthy. Yeah, You know, yep. it's hard to watch when you know somebody is worthy of winning races and they're out there and they're just getting, you know, just riding to a, to outside the top 10, top yeah. 15 finish. It's like, man, it's tough to watch. It's like, just take the time off, get yep. healthy, get your head right. And then come back. Yep. All right. Well, I'm going to throw it over to Todd. We're going to keep talking about a couple of things preceding Detroit this weekend. And we'll see whether or not Todd can run down some of these lap times that I've been putting down because I have not been absolutely shredding like he was earlier on. So take it away, T. All right, handoff commenced. Teej now ripping around as James Stewart here on Detroit 2022. Oh, Ooh, that is very James Stewart-esque. Okay. Man, you know what? They should put some Davalos bales up at the top of that. <laughs> You're just like flying through them. Um, all right, so yeah, a couple more talking points with Detroit coming into this weekend. Uh, Hey, new signing in this 250 class, Jeremy Martin out with a shoulder injury that he suffered in the uh, off week or, you know, practicing in the week leading into Daytona. Of course, Levi Kitchen also went down at the second round in Arlington and he's going to miss some time. So Star Racing Yamaha needed to call on somebody to fill in. And lo and behold, they reached up into the 450 class and pulled veteran Kyle Chisholm down to the 250 class to race. Now, before we get into Chiz, there's a couple talking points that people have brought up about like how is he able to drop down? Isn't he been, you know, top 20 in the 450 standings or top 50? He's top 15 in the 450 standings right now. And isn't he too old? Has he pointed out? He hasn't pointed out yet because he was only in the 250 class for a limited amount of time before he moved up to the 450 class way back in, I think, 08 or 09. And then on top of that, uh, the the rules and the limitations with the riding in the 450 class and then being able to move back down to the 250 class only goes to... 20th place so he uh or excuse me goes to 15th place and he has only finished inside of the top 20 the last couple of years so he's still eligible to move back down they're all within the rules so don't uh have a hissy fit about that but yeah chiz moving back down to the 250 class aside from missing the first main event of the year in anaheim he's made every main since he's finished inside of the top 18 at every main since and as we always kind of say chiz gonna chiz like he just does you know consistent results consistent rides what do you think about this signing for Star Tej? Is this kind of a, a good just, you know, get somebody on the track that can top 10 for us kind of move? Or is this something that maybe they should have contemplated picking somebody else up? I mean, it's a safe, it's a safe route, yeah. right? You're going to have a rider there who you, you know where you're going to get out of him. I mean, obviously, like going from 450 to 250 after so many years, it'll be interesting to see how he does. Um, but I feel like, yeah, you you can probably see him getting being like a top 10 guy on the mm-hmm. East Coast. Like, you know that he's going to be a consistent guy. Um, if you wanted to, you know, get a, roll the dice and maybe you try and get, you know, one of the club of Mex guys, or you, yeah. I, I don't know how, how their contracts are figured out between, you know, club of Mex, Yamaha, things like that. That's what a lot of us were, would, I think we're expecting would be like, Hey, let's get Enzo Lopes or maybe the Nic- Nicoletti move. I don't know. Right. right. Um, but yeah, I think it's the safe move. And like you said, Chiz is going to Chiz and you kind of know what you're going to get. Well, from what I understand, what I heard, nice quad, just busted the quad mid rhythm there. Um, what I heard about club and, uh, you know, it could be wrong, but I just heard that star asked if they could have lopes and club said no, which like okay. I kind of get because if you're, if you're club, you have a guy in Enzo lopes that has 
you know, basically ridden his way. He's third in the championship right now. Mm -hmm. He's ridden his way into the top five several times already this year. Right. Dude is like really showing off your sponsors and, and everybody that's a part of that program really well. And like, not not to be like snide about it, but they had him first. Like yeah. if Star wanted Lopes, like they could have signed him in the off season, but True. they didn't. So um, like I get that, you know, giving Lopes the opportunity is, is a good idea here, but it seems like he's doing just fine by himself, honestly. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, I said it. It would it would be cool to see him uh, because obviously it seems like Star is the premier Yamaha team, if not the premier lights team. Right, right. Um, so I don't know. It, it I, a part of me would love to see him give him given a shot again. You know, like last time we saw him on a factory bike was with what JGR Suzuki. Yeah, it's been three years now or so. Yeah, and I felt like he at that point was still kind of learning the ropes. He's kind of like a. I'm kind of getting like a Joe Shimoda vibe with him. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Where he's like every year, it seems like he's kind of just slowly getting better. Right, right. And now, yeah, I, I see why Club of Mex is like, nah, we kind of, this is our guy. We don't, <laughs> yeah. don't want to give him up. Yeah. Well, back to talking about Chisholm too. Uh, I mean, I personally would put him somewhere in the area of like Phil, like Phil Nicoletti. I would say yeah. if you put both of them in the 450 class, they would finish kind of together. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen this year, like Phil has had top five speed at times. Um, doesn't seem to have the full race distance in him, but hey, you know, you, you give Chiz, who is a guy that has a full race since distance in him, like he's a racer, mm -hmm. and give him Phil Nicoletti's speed. I mean, is it impossible to say that Chiz could be a top five, maybe even a podium threat on that bike? I could see him in the top five. Like, give him a few races, obviously, and we'll yeah. see exactly if he can make a podium. A top five, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him. Um, but I'll, I mean, I don't know. The, the East Coast is kind. Of, I mean, compared to West Coast, it's kind of stacked a little bit. So yeah. it's like a top a top five would be actually pretty impressive. Like I would be impressed with the top five. Right. I, I kind of expect a top ten, and I'd be like, yeah, that sounds about right. But a top five would be like, okay, just mm -hmm. just can do this. And then a podium would be like, uh, I I would be very surprised personally. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see indeed. Well, another talking point in regard to Chiz, obviously, some people are. A little bit frustrated, I think, to see that Star signs somebody that is a veteran and not someone that they could maybe help grow their career. Because yeah. Chiz is on, you know, unfortunately, I guess, speaking the downslope of his career, like he's not mm -hmm. going to keep ascending, I think, from here. Um, he'll probably be a solid guy for the rest of his career, but I don't think that he, you know, gets the star ride and then ascends to winning the 250 title next year or something like that. Right. right. So um, but I did see some people saying like, oh, you should give it to Welton or another privateer right. that's back there that that could really take that ride and use it but if you're looking at it from star's perspective the reason you're putting chiz out there is because you need just anybody on the bike that shows off the sponsors gets the results presence. or whatever right yeah. and and if you pick up a welton or or somebody else that's kind of a project star already has a lot of projects man <laughs> they've got a lot <laughs> of do. kids on that team you know and if you just take away from levi kitchen uh in that pro in that class right now in that program you know, they have Nate Thrasher that they're still working on. And and then they have Nick Romano and uh, Matthew LeBlanc and then mm -hmm. Hayden Deegan and all these kids still coming. They don't really have room to take Welton and become like a project guy with him. Like the only thing that it would help is Welton maybe showing that he's a little bit more capable of what he's at right now, which is like kind of a, you know, mid to backfield privateer guy. Yeah. Maybe he busts into that top 10 and it helps him get a ride on a different team. Yeah. But I don't know if that's really Star's concern or, or worry they just, they just need they results did, and yep. they need to you know work on the projects they have they just want to be at the races like they, they there needs to be an excuse to have the truck there and that you know i'm sure yamaha is paying for that it's like you, there needs to be a reason you need to be at the races every weekend exactly and yep. like you said chisholm is just that guy that they, it's the safe bet and he'll be there for you right 100 percent. and and like i said i mean i, I would like to see welton get a, a chance or, or any other privateer of course it's always mm -hmm. great to see them have a chance but you also have to look at it from a little bit more of the business standpoint yep. and, and star just needs a bike on the track and they know Chiz is going to be a guy that can put it in the main and, and probably hover around top 10 and get a little TV time and just show the sponsors that, Hey, somebody's out there. Right. So, yep. uh, at the end of the day, that's kind of where we're looking at. So talked about rocks and talked about Chiz, but Hey, we're heading into Detroit this weekend. Obviously Daytona was a big shifting point for the 450 class. Jason Anderson, Malcolm Stewart getting together some drama there and it pushed them a little bit further down in the championships so Eli Tomac wins he's got a big points lead um what do you foresee you know kind of being the the keys that we should focus on for Detroit who do you think is going to win um is there anything that we should be looking out for in this 450 class moving into the second half of this championship I don't know I I, 
I want to hope that Anderson's going to bounce back. You know, like, there... I get that he wants to be aggressive, and I get that, you know, there's a little bit, maybe a bad blood there, you know, stewing with stew. (laughs) Stewing Um, with stew. (laughs) But, uh... I feel like, man, you got to see the bigger picture and you kind of got to be like, man, like, let's just put that behind us. Let's just, you know, focus on myself and do what I got to do to win the championship. Because right now it's looking a little rough. I mean, you have Tomac, obviously, now we're on the East Coast swing. And and when he gets strong on East Coast, it's hard to to, to stop him. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, we just saw him win his Daytona and then he just it's he's just on a roll. And yep. when he gets confident, <sighs> nobody can stop him. And I want to. I want um, I want to see Anderson just turn it around again and yeah. be up there and battling with him. And I, I think he's a type of rider that that could like yeah. he's not going to let one bad race mess with anything. Right, right. Um, so he'll be back. Well, we did see a reinvented, reinvigorated, whatever you want to call it, version of Cooper Webb in the last couple of weeks, mm-hmm. especially at Daytona. Uh, I believe as of right now he's like thirty-one points down or something. It, it's still pretty big. But a question that I have in relation to that is, let's just say for for you know championship's sake, Eli Tomac has a bad round. Maybe it's a a crash. Maybe it's a bike malfunction. Maybe it's just a bad ride, and he ends up finishing twelfth, mm. right? And he loses, you know, fifteen points on the night or something like that. Is there a scenario where you can still see Cooper Webb sneaking into this championship fight down the stretch, or are you just like, it's over? It's down to Tomac and whether Anderson can catch him at this point. I I honestly deep I, I I my gut is that I think it's a Tomac Anderson thing. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, like I would love to see another rider in the mix, and if there's other riders that can get in the mix, like other than Webb, that'd be great. But um, I don't know. Like I feel like it's almost too late for Webb to actually kind of make a difference now. Yeah. Um. Obviously, like Daytona, you look he looked better. Um. But will we see? Uh, like I saw uh, Jason Wygant's post saying, you know, like he, he still wants it. Like yeah. he's still showing the emotion of like he has the drive to to uh, still be a top guy. It's just he's just, you know, running into I don't know if it's new bike issues. I don't know if it's, mm-hmm. you know, things he's dealing with personally. But um, I kind of feel like it's a too little too late kind of thing. OK. All right. Well, let me ask you this as a as a wrap up question to this video here. Uh, I had theorized in my review show on Monday that. I'm starting to fall a little bit on the fence too of whether or not even Webb gets a race win this year, which like mm-hmm. he's definitely turned it around for sure, but he still hasn't closed, right? Like right. even if you go back to Minneapolis when he's leading, he falls behind those guys. He eventually gets second because of late crashes, but he's probably going to fall off the podium because of how he was shuffled back. Um, you know, you look at Arlington, sure, he wins the first race, but the other races after that, it just wasn't the same type of ride that we really saw Mm -hmm. out of the first one and then daytona of course like we didn't get a chance to see whether he could close or not but he still hasn't closed one of these things off so do you think and how long will it take for cooper webb to get at least his first win of the year knocked off honestly i don't think it's a matter of i'll answer the question of like i i don't think it's a matter of uh of him winning a race on his own there there's other variables that are gonna have to happen yeah yep and in, in my mind i think that like you know anderson or tomac are, they're gonna have to battle it out for you know laps at a time they're gonna have to take each other out or some you know they're gonna have to go down their own ways multiple or, you know each one go down in their own way um for coop to have a chance for him to just like pull shot and then just straight up win i i don't know if i could see that happening yeah, yeah. I, I i don't um it would take other variables to happen. And can that happen? Yeah. Like easily. Yep. But as far as him just straight up whole shotting and, and, and winning the thing, I, I don't see it. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. That That's a hard question. I, 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 like I said, I don't think he just straight up wins race. I just think there's other variables that need to happen. All right. All right. Fair enough. All right, folks. Well, that is our little preview of the 2022 Detroit Supercross round 10 of Monster Energy Supercross coming up this weekend. If you guys want to try this track as well, by the way, it is on the PC version of Monster Energy Supercross 3. Uh, It is called Pre-Detroit, all one word, P-R-E-Detroit. 
2022. So if you want to search either my name, Kellen, on Steam, K-E-L-L-E-N, or just search pre-Detroit 2022 on the PC, you can try this track out for yourself. Get yourself revved up for the weekend as we get ready to drop the gates on round 10 of Monster Energy Supercross. Thanks, guys, for tuning in, and I hope to see you guys in the next one. So long for now. <laughs> <laughs> of course I get it then. <laughs>